Computer, this is Data. I'm an android. I'm a Majestic basketball. I was processing all of the information. Processing. It's one of those idiots who believe in analytics. Majestic basketball. Analytics was crap. Does not compute. Just because you got good stats doesn't mean you're a good team. Hello and welcome back to the Lakers Exceptionalism Podcast, live on Playback. My name is Tom Z, joined as always by Tim, aka Cranjus McBasketball. And Tim, how are you doing today, man? We are we got like five days left till free agency. We just had the draft. Man, things are moving fast here in Lakers Land. Yeah, things are moving quickly. We uh have plenty more coverage to give you on the rookies and the undrafted free agents, but we are turning our attention fully to free agency because it is coming quickly uh and then after this once the team's put together a little bit we can really dig into summer league enjoy all of that and dig into some of those younger guys but yeah tom it's been a grind we uh shout out to everyone in the discord we've yeah, been for sure uh, grinding away our, our project ghostbusters uh titled that way because it's uh who are you gonna call right who, who are the lakers gonna call they've got some money they need to add some talent to this team who's realistic and who should they be looking to target based on which players are available, how much money they have to spend. And there's just so much to try to sort out with that sort of situation. And it really took a team of those minds getting together, doing the dirty work, looking through all 30 teams. And we were able to map out for each team. All right, what are we doing with our own free agents? What's most likely from a player option standpoint, a team option standpoint, are we guaranteeing deals or waiving guys? All right. And then based on all of that, Here's how much money we have to spend and what our needs are. And then when you map that out for 30 teams, the very murky, you know, what can we get turns into pretty clear like, oh, okay, this is the handful of guys that the team should really be focusing on. We don't want to give you an hour long mm-hmm. podcast where we talk about players that are going to go for twice the salary the Lakers can offer. Yeah, exactly. And that's why putting in that dirty work and doing this has yielded in previous years some pretty good results in terms of not just picking who the Lakers yep. should target and did target and even obtained, uh, but then also figuring out what some other teams have grabbed. And like we nailed the Nas Reed deal. There are a couple others. I mean, I mean, many others I'm expecting to go well once things play out. But uh, I don't know. It's like setting a March Madness bracket. You're planning it all out. And then it's time to sit back and then watch and enjoy. But, but we wanted to report back out and give you all who we think the Lakers have a realistic shot at. You know, unlike in 2K, you can't be stuck on the same day doing all the research, trying all the fake trades and, you know, the day before the trade deadline. You got to you got to do the research. And it's basically what you're doing, Tim, to me is just mimicking what the process is, I feel like, uh, for for these GMs and these scouts as they try to figure out, you know, what's the cheapest, what's the most value they can get. You got to comb through all the possible decisions to figure out you know, practical application of, of your plans and what you intend to do. But what we intend to do today, Tim, is talk a little bit first about the Lakers' own free agents at the guard position, uh, what that could look like for those numbers. Because assuming, you know, you do this for all the different teams in the league, Tim, we can get an idea for what D'Angelo Russell's trade uh, market value is based on what who has cap space. And, you know, Utah just traded for John Collins today. I'm sure that you know, changes their their cap sheet significantly. Uh, I think they could still get to like 20 million or so. But anyway, we're going to dive into that first, Tim, as well as talking about some of the guys we watched film on. Um, for those of you listening on the pod, you can check that out on Playback with us live, or you can check that out um, on YouTube the day after. So yeah, Tim, talk to me about the Lakers guard situation. Uh, D'Angelo Russell, let's start there. Do we think he is going to get up to 25 million, 20 million around there. It, well, so that's the tricky thing. It's all right. Well, how does he stack up among the other free agents? And so one thing that we put out, you'll see there's about 7,000 votes on this. If we took, take a look at point guards, that'll be on the market. I put this out earlier today and everyone, people voted, uh, which free agent has the higher value on the market. And, and if we go here, it'll give us two players. All right. Dennis Smith Jr. or Fred Van Vliet. All right, we're going to pick. Van Vliet. Next one, Carter or Jones. We'll pick Carter. I don't know. And you can go through a bunch of head-to-head matchups. And after aggregating all of those, it's able to create this list here for us and spit out 
relative to each other, how much different players are valued on that open market. And again, oh, it's not awesome. GMs doing this. It's not scouts doing this. It is, you know, you, me, and the, and the good people doing this. And something I've learned more and more is that, uh, you know, general consensus seems to be pretty good with this stuff. Uh, any one individual of us may have our own biases or skew certain ways or like certain skill sets, but throw everyone together and it ends up being pretty good. And so from that time, we end up seeing that Kyrie Irving grades out at the highest at a 95 out of 100, James Harden at a 94, Van Vliet at an 86, and then our good friend D'Angelo Russell at an 85. So he's, according to this information, perhaps the fourth most coveted free agent point guard on the market. You'll notice Dennis Schroeder is down just a couple spots below him at sixth. And uh, Russell Westbrook is a little bit lower, uh, just at seventh as well. So some familiar names. Pat Beverly is not too far behind. Some familiar names on here. And so based off of that, we can then go back and compare with a list of, all right, well, what, what does each team have to offer and try to map out what makes sense to give to different players. Like with Dealey, you got a solid pick and roll player for seasons. He's been a reliable pull three point shooter, including this past one until he became a Laker. Not really an ISO guy, not the best at pressuring the rim, but finishes pretty well. Once he's there, he's a good, not great playmaker for others. Defensively, someone you hide away off ball a little bit, not great in actions, but communicates rotates real well. We saw that in the playoffs. We saw that on the film reviews. Um, but he, Tom is a bird unrestricted free agent. So the Lakers can yeah. offer him, 20 million, 25 million, help more if they wanted to a year. So they can, they're, they're equipped. And we'll see this is a bit different from Dennis when we talk about him later. The Lakers can offer him a bunch of money. He's not restricted. So if another team offers him a deal and he accepts it, he's gone. LA doesn't have a chance to match. But they engaging with him in this process should be doing what we're doing and mapping out who else could offer him money. And what that might look like, and then go to him and say, hey, here's our initial offer. If you're able to go find more, come back to us. Let's have a conversation. We'd love to keep you. We enjoyed having you here. And and try to work it through that way. Um, so I think that that sets the stage a bit. And then it comes down to, like, who has cap space? And after mapping out those 30 teams, here are the teams that have cap space. Most likely, like like after they make all these decisions, maybe not today, mm -hmm. right now, this moment, they have this much cap space. But after what they're going to do, what they're probably going to do, we've got Detroit, who kind of needs a wing. And there's a perfect one available for them. We'll talk about on the next show tomorrow. Okay, Oklahoma City, they could use a wing. There's a perfect one available for them. We'll talk about on the show tomorrow. That fits their, <laughs> their age timeline. He, they're like right, right price zone. Everything makes sense. Uh, Orlando, they're going to have cap space, but they're probably going to spend their money on a center. Uh, there's a perfect one for them available. We'll talk about that on Thursday. Washington. Washington's going to be interesting because they're going to have either a good bit of money if Kuzma walks or keep Kuz and then you don't have that, that big bag of money. But what they'll most likely do is either retain him or try to replace him if they are spending money. And I've got a hunch, and we were talking about this in the Discord, and some of y'all in here were, were part of that conversation. There's a good chance they try to keep doing what they've been doing and rather than try to spend all this money to try to be good right now, they use that as space to trade players into along with some assets, you know, hopefully doing a little bit better job, uh, maybe getting some draft a capital compared to what they've been doing so far. But use that space, take on bad contracts, take on some draft assets, build around, you know, for the future, not trying to be good right now with, with you know, uh, Jordan Poole and some of the other guys they have. So there's a good chance they may not be all that active. And if they are, their backcourt is set. They don't really need to go spend a bunch of money on a point card. You know, they could, but just timeline-wise, it doesn't make all that much sense. Now, there are three teams I'd say we should be monitoring. Indiana. Indiana could use a two or a three. And when we look at the shooting guard list here, two of the top guys you're going to see, Austin Reeves and Bruce Brown, right up there at the top. Jordan Clarkson, Dante DiVincenzo, Karis LeVert. So these are some of the top guys. Bruce Brown and Reeves could be guys on their radar. However, Bruce ba Brown has no, like Denver doesn't have bird rights with him. They'll be able to outbid the Nuggets. And he makes a lot of sense for them positionally, versatility wise. And he may very well be who they're pursuing. Uh, so they may not be a team, but they could be a team to pursue Reeves. We'll have to see what that looks like. Brown seems easier to get. He seems to fit what they're looking like more. 
we'll have to see. Yeah, I was thinking, that, Tim, maybe Reeves makes more sense for them, but that's we'll, we'll talk about that later. Yep. And then there's uh, Houston. The Rockets are going to have a lot of money, and they are planning to pursue some slightly uh, you know, bigger prey, perhaps. Um, they may be going after some of these top guys. Guys here, Fred Van Vliet is a name that stands out and is someone that makes a lot of sense for them. They'll have the money to spend on him, and we'll have to see if that pans out or not. But keep an eye out for that. And then they will also have some additional money, and they'd most likely spend it on a wing or perhaps a big with the remaining cap space or a portion of the re- remaining cap space. So if they do pursue Van Vliet, I think we're probably safe with D'Lo and Reeves for them specifically. And then the last team would be the San Antonio Spurs. Now, if Van Vliet does go, either he stays in Toronto or he goes with Houston, and we'll say Kyrie sticks around in Dallas, Harden, we've seen uh, Woj report, he and Philly are working to try to bring him back. I think these top two guys probably stay put. Van Vliet either stays in Toronto or goes to Houston, and then D'Lo becomes the top dog. And San Antonio could be interested. Is he the type of point guard, though, that that – they'd really be interested in like, is he a pop guy to you, Tom? He doesn't stand out like a uh, Spurs culture kind of player. Uh, Yeah. No. Austin Reeves on the other hand, but yes. uh, D'Angelo Russell getting along with pop after just giving him a bunch of money uh, does not. And trying to, you know, work around a, a young big though. I do think there's some merit to having a vet point guard. You know, I think like Van Viet to the Rockets makes sense. They'll have some leadership and, you know, be able to get some guys in the right spots. But yeah, no, <laughs> D'Angelo, D'Angelo <laughs> Russell like wouldn't be allowed into uh, the city of San Antonio. Yeah, yeah, I I don't see it either. So I'm not as worried about D'Lo. I we do know though that Pop loves to uh you know pass to the Lakers where he can, and mm-hmm. this might be a team if they don't go for D'Lo. They actually have like a pretty good shooting guard group with with uh, Devin Vassell, who they really like, uh, Sissoko, who they just drafted, both on the roster. They have a, a, a third backup as well, uh, who played last year, showed some highlights. A uh, rookie out of Notre Dame, and then got injured. didn't Didn't play too much the rest of the year. But if they were, I don't know. I, I can see them throwing money at Reeves just to piss the Lakers off. And if they get him, great, um, <laughs> because I think he would fit in well. Uh, D'Lo, I don't see it quite as much. And I think it may be realistic for San Antonio to just hang on to Devontae Graham, hang on to Trey Jones, and just kind of wait until next year to try to make a move at point guard. So that's what I'm seeing things look like there. And so if this is what's going to happen, D'Lo's not getting a cap space offer. Those are the teams with cap space. I don't think he's getting a deal from the Spurs. I don't think he's getting a deal from the Rockets unless Van Vliet uh, in Toronto becomes much more solid. The Pacers aren't going to offer D'Lo. The the Pacers could be a Reeves threat. The Spurs could potentially be a Reeves threat. But I think from a D'Lo standpoint, there's a really good chance that you go into negotiations with him and have the upper hand because he doesn't have, you know, he hasn't been talking to a team and they've got this big offer. He's ready to accept unless you spend all the money in the world on him. So Right. From a D'Lo standpoint, I think LA's in a pretty good position to try to play some hardball and, you know, pay him well, but don't pay him ridiculously well to the point where it's like an awful contract that that really hurts you as you're trying to build around him with the rest of the team. Tim, is the do you know if they like uh they hold the the you know, when you offer a restricted free agent a contract, they hold that money basically until the the other team has that chance to say yes or no for Two days, I think, 48 hours. Is that still the case at this new CBA? Do you know? That used to be the case. It has now gone down to only 24 hours. So in theory – I thought it went down. Yeah. But that's still a factor, I think. If you want to give – that's what they – that's why they lowered it, I think, is to give the other team some time but not tie up all your cap space for all those many days because you lose out on opportunity cost, right? Yep, exactly. That was the the two day thing was brutal because let's say the Spurs do offer or no, let's say let's uh, let's say the Rockets offer Austin Reeves, and the Lakers know they're going to match, but they're going to wait forty seven hours and fifty nine minutes to do so, <laughs> and then right. all that money is tied up, and Houston can't spend it elsewhere, and then it hurts them. So that's 
that's been historically part of the reason why these restricted free agents aren't pursued. It's not just that the the incumbent team can match the offer. It's that they can tie your money up in the process. And a lot happens yeah. the first couple of days of free agency. And you don't want to go in having, you know, spent your one bullet and having to just like, you know, wait a couple of business days to figure out what happened. Yeah. Yeah. So just some context, at least on that end, Tim. Um, but we, we should keep it, pick up the pace a tiny bit here. What do you think about on the Reeves end of things projecting, I guess, um, it, it, you know, we kind of paired them cause we're talking about, you know, guard players who, who could fit on young teams. Um, I think Reeves makes more sense for both Houston and San Antonio, but is that, is that where their priority will be for the cap space? I don't know. So yeah, for D'Lo, it's to the sign and trade teams, to your point, somebody going to hard cap themselves for D'Angelo Russell. Is he the missing piece for somebody like that? I, I don't see that either. So yeah, uh, wrap it up, I guess, here a tiny bit with the number, I guess, or a projection you think you might have. Yeah, so I, I guess the one last thing, before I give you a number for Reed, well, okay, so for D'Lo, from a number standpoint, if he's not going to get offers above the full MLE, which is like $14 million, if you're able to get him at 18 to 20 mil a year, average annual value, I, I think that's probably, you know, it's good for him. It's a good bit better than what else he can get even when you factor in what taxes in California look like compared mm-hmm. to some of these other places, which is something I d- digging it a little bit more. Like that makes a difference when you're looking at guys, you know, picking between like a min or a taxpayer MLE. Sure. Like if you're, you know, in, in Texas or, or Florida, like you have a nice advantage over some of these other States, but sorry, that out of the way, <laughs> I think maybe two years, 40 mil or so for yeah. two, two years, you know, 38 million, something like that for d you know, pays him well, should bring him back, shouldn't be an offensive offer, and is understanding of the market. They could try to squeeze a bit more, but I think that might be what we're looking at. Now, with Reeves, his situation is a little bit different. He's a restricted free agent. He's also an early bird player. And because he's entering his restricted free agency after his second year in the league, this makes the Gilbert Arenas rule apply to him as well, which helps the Lakers by limiting what he can be offered and what that looks like from other teams. So even if another team wants to throw a bunch of money at him, we got two things in the Lakers' favor. One, they can match anything that's thrown at him. Two, the structure of the deal won't be another team offering him you know, $20 million next season. Even if he gets a nice big deal of like four years, what is it, 98 mil, 99 mil, something like that, the first couple of years of the deal are going to be in the $11, $12 million price range, I believe. So it makes it more palatable short term and then it jumps up after the second season of that deal yeah, for crazy. season three and four. Yeah. So it is a big jump. This was what yeah. we were, this was the same situation we were in with THT potentially. Yeah. And so, you know, that's a little scary. What plays into our favor here though, if you're, the, if you're thinking from a Laker perspective and trying to save money is what we just talked about. I don't see a team that's going to offer Reeves that money and him be like their, you know, top free agent. Now the Spurs can try to do something like that just to try to tie him up for the Lakers and try to drive the price up. But I don't think Austin Reeves is the number one target on any board buddies board for these other teams. He very well be the number one target for the Lakers or number two target for the Lakers. But I think just like with D'Lo, we're going to be going into a situation where they're anticipating they'll be able to get him back for sure. And they're not going to need to pay anything crazy. I've been told, and LA isn't being shy about this, they're telling teams they're happy to match whatever Reeves is offered. Same thing with Rui. So yeah. they're telling teams, hey, yeah, if you want to, you know, tie your money up for 24 hours, go for yeah. it. We'll call, you know, we'll bring them back. So I mean, to be fair, that's, that's what you do, right? That's what yeah. you do. You say, no, yeah, that's what everyone does. They're like, yeah, we're going to pay them. Yeah, totally. Yeah. That's and like also I hope Austin gets a bunch of money. But if you're sure. the Lakers front office, you got to do your job too. And so that's where the – Managing relationships while also doing the best thing for the cap sheet, you got to try to find that balance. So, I, you know, I think that's well within their rights, of course, to try to make it known and message publicly, you know, this is what we're going to do. And you'll see various people talking about, you know, Lakers are very confident they'll be able to bring these guys back. They'll, they'll match whatever other teams send. Now, if we hear counter programming of, well, the Lakers are worried if, if too much money is thrown at them, they might lose them. That is just incentivizing teams who are hearing that to probably say, oh, he is obtainable. Well, let's go make that offer, which isn't good for the Lakers. 
It's not good if you're another team who was planning to offer him anyway. That is good for Austin Reeves. And so as we hear more news come out, understand where it's coming from. We're, we're getting to that time of the year. Um, so want to bring him back. Hope he gets paid well. You know, hope it isn't what like keeps the Lakers from being able to you know spend more money elsewhere to, to build a title contender. Yeah, um, I saw that tweet from Lakers Nation about uh, JHS, you know, being drafted as a possible Austin replacement. And I don't know. I try to take everything with a grain of salt right now. I hope that's not the case, but you never know. Um, quickly, Tim, about Dennis Schroeder. Uh, he, you know, was on a, a prove-it contract. He <laughs> caps in chat. Um, he is on a prove-it contract this year, and it feels like he pr- did a good job proving himself as a backup point guard. Uh, where does that put him, I guess, in this in this guard free agency landscape? And what can the Lakers hope to bring him back for if, if they want him back? Yeah, good question. So LA's in a little bit of a spot here with Dennis just because there are a lot of teams that will be needing point guard play. He is, according to our, our projection here, uh, based on this voting, he was the what sixth highest, one, two, three, four, five, sixth highest valued free agent on this market. There's a bit of a drop off from him to the next couple of players. So as we look at who has money and how it might be spent, Houston, as we mentioned, has cap space. They're going to spend it on a point guard. Cleveland and Memphis will have full MLEs most likely to spend on a point guard. Same with the Lakers if they lose D'Lo, and we'll, we'll talk about some of those iterations later. Uh, same with Toronto if they lose Fred Van Vliet. So if Houston does indeed steal Van Vliet, now Toronto's got a full MLE and they're looking for a replacement. So we've got one, two, three, four teams right there who aren't the Lakers. And then Utah will have a room MLE, most likely to spend on a point guard. And that's what, one, two, three, four, that, what, that's five teams. And then we get into this next big tier where Boston, Brooklyn, Chicago, Denver, Minnesota, and Toronto uh, well, and actually we can take Toronto off if they, they move up here, but that's a bunch of teams that will have a taxpayer MLE and they'll most likely be spending that on a point guard. So if we just kind of look at the numbers here, most likely, unless a team really values Dennis or a lot of teams really aren't valuing him the way that we have him here, he's probably going to be in that taxpayer MLE tier. He is a non-bird unrestricted free agent which means the Lakers, if they were just trying to give him a raise to keep him, with the new CBA, they can offer a 140% offer of what he had last year. So it would be about two and a half, 2.6 million. Uh, that'd be about half that taxpayer MLE. Or the Lakers can use their exception to keep him, which after spending the 17th pick on uh, JHS, maybe wouldn't be the most wise allocation of resources, but it kind of depends on what you could get among wings and bigs for the same price point. So if they do keep him, It'd be with that taxpayer MLE. And that would be about, right. you know, be the same money as these other five or six teams can offer him. And, you know, accounting for, hey, some of these other teams, he'll get more playing time. Some of these other teams, he'll be able to take home more money after taxes. You know, it's not a given that you would bring him back, especially again, after drafting a point guard. Now, the BAE, the biannual exception, would also be in the same price range, just slightly less than the taxpayer MLE. But that hard caps you at the first apron. So if the Lakers are using their taxpayer Emily, that means they're they're over that first apron. They're they're you know that's not really the BA is not really in the question at that point. This would be if they're able to use that full non taxpayer mid level exception, they will in all likelihood be able to also use the BAE. So if they lose D'Lo and a couple of these other things we'll talk about later, then maybe they'll have the bigger money to spend on someone, and then also the smaller chunk of change to maybe bring Schroeder back. So that's what things should look like. And I mean, just looking at it, it, I don't think the Lakers probably should spend their one exception to bring him back. Now, if they lose D'Lo, maybe the story changes. And he, again, then does become one of the higher free agents available, but not, not an ideal situation. And I think it's, you know, it's tough to see him being that guy, because they're not going to be able to bring him back without using that exception. Yeah, unfortunately, I feel like if if Dennis is back, something has gone wrong with your offseason. Um, you know, he's you know he's going to make more money than the men, uh, which he was on last year. So he's played himself up. You know, I think other teams are showing interest now where they weren't before. And um, but I I 
oh, guy still feels like a second option for this team. Mm-hmm. Uh, even though, you know, I love him. I know Ham loves him. Um, you know, Lakers obviously brought him back uh, with this group, but I think he's probably gone. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so Jalen Huchif, you know, him coming in, he's, he's, he's come in to take that Dennis spot. And I think the Lakers mapped this out, realized they're not going to bring him back. They gra- they drafted this guy to do that. And if we look at how, what kind of impact Dennis had last season for Jalen Hood Shafino to match that, if we look at rookie point guard performances over the past decade in our LeBron database at People Index, he would need to have 72nd percentile performance among, again, those rookie point guards over the past decade to match what Dennis was doing. 76th percentile on offense, that's a little steeper. 54th percentile on defense seems doable. So I wouldn't be surprised. And I, I, you know, I don't know that we should expect a rookie to come in and be an above average player, but Dennis wasn't an above average player last year. So compared to Dennis, I think JHS has a decent chance to be able to come in and replicate what he was able to provide. And then the Lakers are able to spend that money on a wing or a big and try to better the team overall. All right. So transitioning kind of from the guys on the Lakers we talked about how many different paths they have with those three guys, right? And uh, and like you said, they drafted uh, a guard, so they have an option there. But what, I guess, other options? I, you, we talked to, we watched them in the intro. Um, Dennis Smith Jr., Javon Carter, Josh Kogi, and Seth Curry. Which of those, I guess, excites you the most? And you know, you think would make sense? Uh, and I don't know. We're we're getting in very hypotheticals but let's say they trade d'angelo russell for someone else and they need somebody you know they bring back dennis at a low number and it's austin dennis and insert guard here you know um what kind of guards are you looking at in those kind of possible outcomes so i would say the highest value and and this is how he graded out based on the voting the highest value guy is probably javon carter and he would be if you lose dennis and you get that non-taxpayer MLE, that's probably his price range. He is not a strong pick and roll player. He is not a strong playmaker. Where you will see him be strong, though, is defensively very strong as as we take a look at his uh, perimeter defensive rating grades against rotation point of attack defenders last season. Uh, A in perimeter isolation defense, A minus ball screen navigation, B in off screen off ball chaser defense. These are all difficulty adjusted. He was getting the job done as a perimeter defender. He's also a pretty strong three-point shooter. And I think that's an area of his game that differentiates him from some of these other guys on the list. And that's something where when we take a look at him, again, let's see, Carter, look at all these A's and a couple B's in there. That's nice. That's a lot better than some of these other guys. And so this would be more to the bubble title team mold of more nominal point guard play space out and play defense he's that three and d point guard and that's what i'd be looking at if if you're just looking to spend that non-taxpayer mle now dennis smith jr is someone that charlotte will likely use their mle to try to retain so if you're going to try to get him you'd probably have to spend that as well now he as we saw in the highlight video in the beginning or just the film in the beginning not highlights but the film in the beginning he is not a strong perimeter shooter as we as we can see here However, he is a pretty strong defensive player, really good pickpocket rating, A minus, A passing lane defense. And again, this is among point of attack defenders. This isn't among everybody. This is among, you know, a pretty high bar. Defensive impact as a rebounder, defensive talent as a rebound, pretty strong. Um, his rim deterrence and rim point save in terms of him def- uh, deterring and disrupting shots at the rim, again, among these guards, really strong. A and A plus grades there. So defensively, he's good at a lot of stuff. He's really good at getting to the rim, as we saw. He's got some hops, as mm-hmm. you mentioned in the chat as the, we were warming up. He would not be a good spacer, but is strong in other areas. I just don't know that it's the best fit. Um, yeah. Now, at the taxpayer MLE, I think Dennis is probably the, the best you're looking at. And then, if you are looking at Mins, I think among point guards, Aaron Holiday is somebody that interests me as I, as I move over to his player profile at People Index. We see a gold pickpocket badge, clamps badge, bronze pick dodger badge, really good perimeter defensive player, lower offensive impact, solid defensive impact. But we see B plus three point shot making. Good three point percentage on easier shots. That's what he'd get here. 
in terms of his finishing, gets to the rim, pretty good rate. Finishing once there, below average, but not awful. His playmaking, not ideal, for especially for a point guard. That's okay, you're on the Lakers. And then perimeter defense, really, really nice stuff over here. Really, really good, disruptive player. And uh, we've, we've seen that materialize into good defensive impact. So I think from a fit standpoint, if I'm looking at one men, I like him. Chris Dunn, Corey Joseph, Derek Rose, Frank Nielakina. Those are some of the other men's that I think would be available at that price point that would be point guard options for the team. Yeah, I don't I, – I think Carter would be great. Uh, I think that's a great fit and a good call out. Now, obviously, there's a relationship with Ham already. Um, but it's it's where the guards come in. Like I see us adding a free agent guard a little bit less likely, but I don't know, uh, especially since we spent uh, some draft capital there. But we'll see. You know, they have a lot of stuff up in the air. Um, Josh Akogi, you know, has some great defensive plays, but – can't shoot either it's it's like so many of these guys are in two buckets they're the you know carter is pretty pretty good on defense as well uh and and makes his threes and uh and like i said has that relationship and and played on a on a good team but it's other and i'm intrigued by smith jr i can't lie um he looks really good on the film and he's improved a lot on defense over the years but he can't shoot at all and (laughs) Yeah, it's that's it's pretty bad. Yep, that's the challenge. That's just, and we've got the same challenge. If we look to the shooting guards, which uh, the taxpayer MLE, I think you'd be looking at a Kogi for the men, maybe Seth Curry, others at the men, Josh Richardson, Jalen Noel, Austin Rivers, and Aaron Wiggins are some potential options. If we look at a Kogi, really nice defensive player, really good from a defensive badge standpoint, grades out well as a rebounder from an impact standpoint, was strong took on tough matchups, was quite versatile. F three-point shot making on 97th percentile shot quality. That's ugh, that's the one piece. That's the one. If he could just be okay, he's going to get really good shot quality. If he could just be okay, that would look so much better. Now his overall three-point percentage is about 34%. Not the worst thing in the world, about 35% of catch and shoot threes. It's just, you know, he's underperforming. But here's the thing. Yes, he's underperforming. However... Within the context, he's still able to generate 35%. It's not, you know, it's it's worse than what other guys would give you, but for a guy that creates well at the rim, doesn't finish well at the rim, but creates well at the rim, is is drawing contact on drives quite well, and is really strong, versatile defensive player, he's still valuable, even if he's underperforming on his threes. Very, very active rebounder, as we see here in the data. Incredible defensive player, really strong interior defense, especially for a two or three. And this is why the overall impact looks real good. So unlike Dennis Smith Jr., I I think he's found ways to kind of put it all together. And the degrees of bad three-point shooting are a little bit different where he's been able to give you like a decent percentage. Whereas if you look at Dennis Smith Jr., he's shooting in like the the mid 20% on his three-pointers. So it's quite a difference. And that's why a, a Kogi stands out to me. I'd be very intrigued by him. And he's someone that in Phoenix, they only have his non-bird right. So if you can offer him the taxpayer MLE, you should be able to get him. So I think in a weaker buyer's market from a team standpoint on two guards, a Kogi would be a guy the Lakers could look to steal if they decide to allocate the resources that way. Regardless of if they bring uh, Reeves and D'Lo back, you could have D'Lo, JHS as your ones, Reeves and a Kogi as your twos. Maybe you move Beasley. Like, I, maybe Max Christie is a three now. Like those, right. that's some some of the stuff you could be looking at. And, and I think Akogi is a name I'm keeping an eye out for. Aaron Holiday is a name I really like at the min among point guards. Uh, and I think, you know, those are some of the guys that along with bringing D'Lo and Reeves back, I could see making some sense. Yeah, I would love that. Um, you know, hopefully they could you know, get some more wing depth somewhere along there as well. Or maybe they're, you know, like you said, banking on Max Christie. And, you know, we haven't talked about Lonnie Walker, a little bit more of a wing. And, you know, I don't really know what to project for him next year. I don't think he'll have a role. Um, I don't know. If, I don't know how you think he fits in, Tim, but uh, he is still on this team. <laughs> he is. Yeah. Uh, so Lonnie, I- he just just quickly he projects to be a min guy. So if the Lakers did want to bring him back, 
just basically on the same salary with a little bit of. I mean, they they gave him the MLA, so they'll be able to outpay just about anybody that's going for him, unless the teams making some really odd decisions. I don't see a team giving him an MLA. It doesn't. It doesn't really make sense unless they really are valuing him a bit more than the data is, and the folks in the voting valued him. Because I just I don't know. He 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 gives you some flashes, but on a play by play by play basis, I don't. It's it's tough. It's <laughs> tough. So I don't know. I he's someone that like if you're the Lakers, you don't want to pay more than the min with that slot. So maybe if he comes back at the min, sure. But I don't want to pay him eight million dollars to be your your twelfth man or something like that when the team maybe have to you know worry about that second apron and, and trying to stay under that so they can use that taxpayer annually. So something to think about. Yeah, we're gonna keep an eye on uh, how the musical chairs goes down around the league because sometimes you know just like the draft, you can uh, you can be left with a partner you weren't expecting, uh, both for better or for worse, but. Uh, any other names you got here, Tim, you want to throw out for guards? Uh, we did mention Seth Curry in the video. He still great shooter, you know, is able to kind of create off of close closeouts too. Um, good, you know, veteran guy. I think he still has some left in the tank, but I don't think he's a minimum guy, right? So he projects to actually end up being a minimum guy just based on oh, the market. I thought and like I tax could... pyramid level kind of guy. I, I wouldn't be surprised, but having mapped out which teams need like what positions and for how much money, like it, it ended up being a pretty weak shooting guard buyers market. Mm. And I think that's why. And normally I think he would be getting more, but and like, you know, pretty pretty decent shooter, pretty strong score. Mm-hmm. Defense is terrific, but yeah, he shoots the hell out of the ball. He can score well at the rim. Like there, there are some things to like here with his game. The impact has, has not been strong as we see here on the screen, but as a spot up guy, you can do a whole lot worse than an A minus. Another guy that is similarly lots of offense, not as much defense, and actually who has, I believe, been a bit more effective offensively recently is Jalen Noel, who Minnesota may be letting walk. Um, he gets downhill well, you know, finishes well off the rim, solid in transition, good contact finisher as a shorter guy is interesting. Um, but again, that, that three-point shooting, as we've seen with a couple other players, tricky, creates well, finishes well. Through. Like, there's there's stuff to like. There are guys with individual skill sets that make sense. On another team, this guy makes sense. Even with him being a poor defender, offensively quite strong, that overall is around an average player from an impact standpoint. It's just that for this Lakers team, you probably don't want a non-shooting one or two. And that changes, I think, how you're – you're evaluating the available options. So, I mean, if we want to hang out, like I can run through some more of these guys, but I think we've called out the names I think are pertinent. Guys you haven't heard me call out, like uh, Dante DiVincenzo, Bruce Brown, those guys the Lakers won't be able to afford. They just won't be able to afford them. Here's Aaron Wiggins. These are some nice grades. Aaron Wiggins shot well from deep, got to and finished at the rim well. Okay, playmaking, not great among a guard, but perimeter defense, pretty solid. Wiggins is a guy I'd, I'd be potentially interested in as well. This is a younger player that you could look to invest in. Played at wing stopper roles, a 6'5", uh, guard, a two guard. Played as a stretch big on offense, which is a funny way to use a player. But uh, I don't know. I think Wiggins, Holiday, those are some of the min guys that are intriguing to me that – fit a bit. Josh Richardson was someone I used to be interested in, but I think he's gotten a bit older and not playing as well. Same thing with Corey Joseph, same thing with Derek Rose, Nittle Kina, the spacing you worry about, Chris Dunn, the offense you worry about in general. So those are some of the players. Yeah, I see Clarkson in the chat. No, the Lakers will not be able to afford no. uh, afford Jordan Clarkson. If I pull up, like, yeah, here's some of the other guys they can't afford. Karis LeVert, not going to be able to afford him. And it's not just the ordering here, but some of these guys are on teams that will prioritize bringing them back because if they let them walk, they won't be able to afford a replacement. There are other guys on here that their teams are like, we can't afford, like Bruce Brown, his team can't do anything. They've got the non-bird rights. There's nothing they're going to be able to do. So that situation at an individual level, which is something we mapped out in the Ghostbusters file here, and we've got, you know, what the the team's going to be planning to do, what some of the offers might look like that's the kind of, you know, detail that has to go into play for you to be able to really map these things out. Nikhil Alexander Walker, 
you know, decent player, they're going to prioritize bringing him back. And so he's not going to be available while Josh Okogie, who graded out about the same from a, you know, which free agent player has the higher value on the market in that eval, grades out about the same, but he's going to be available because his team can't afford to keep him. So that's kind of how some of this is playing out as well. You can't just stack up who's the best and try to, you know, say, all right, well, we can afford the six best guys. So one, two, three, four, five, six. You also have to account for what the individual teams will be doing with their own free agents and their individual pursuits and interests and all of that. So there's a lot to factor in and it takes a lot of work, but I'm glad we've done it. And if you want to see that Ghostbusters file, that's available in the Discord. Don't have to be at any special tier, but uh, do check that Discord out and you'll be able to dig in a bit more with us as we continue to map out what everything looks like, not just for the Lakers, but with other teams as well. Yeah, you can DM us a five-star a screenshot of a five-star review on your podcast player of choice and DM Tim or I or Johnny or uh, the Lakers pod, uh, uh, you know, Twitter account and send us that screenshot. We'll get you in and you can uh, subscribe like Tim was saying and, and help us out, you know, really appreciate everybody. It's great. Like, again, this is the discord season. This is, you know what I mean? I'm bored. I'm going to watch a bunch of film on <laughs> javon carter which i didn't expect today but <laughs> it's fun mm-hmm. it's it's good you never know where it's going to take you and speculating is half the fun so thank you everybody for joining us if you're uh first time on playback we're going to play the video that we played to open we just got about four or five minutes on each guy we talked about if you want to stay and watch that otherwise um yeah tim we'll be here tomorrow night as well at 6 p.m all right yeah we'll see you then we'll be talking wings next so I, I don't know that we're going to see the L- L.A. spend their MLE on a guard. Wing might be more likely. So stay tuned. We'll see who the Lakers can afford that. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night.